into the big picture uh, of climate change. So real, real basics, what is carbon capture and storage? It's a means, uh, by the way, can you see my arrow that I move on the screen? If I need to highlight yep. anything? Yeah, good. Can... Okay. So it's a means to prevent emissions from ever getting in to the atmosphere. Uh, if you have a power plant or an industrial facility, uh, as it emits its, uh, its, its gases from, from combustion of fossil fuels through various means uh, uh, using chemicals and, and phys physical means, that CO2 can be stripped out of or scrubbed from the, uh, from the gases emitting. And then it can be put into a pipeline at a very high compression and pumped into a secure geologic storage area. Uh, could be an old oil and gas reservoir, uh, which we've been doing for several decades and, and it has a good record of staying down there, not emitting, or uh, in future years, particularly, we could be uh, injecting it into saline formations where, again, um, scientists believe that it will be securely, permanently isolated from the atmosphere. Um, it might even be piped eventually to, to, to ships to transport to a geologic area, but this is the key piece of it. You capture it, you transport it, and you put it in a secure geologic area. Every once in a while you might see reference to CCUS, meaning carbon capture, perhaps utilization of that gas, which we'll turn to in a second, and, and storage. We basically treat those as, as equivalent. The second use of carbon capture is what's called carbon dioxide removal. This is literally, we already put it up in the atmosphere. We have ways to actually remove it from the atmosphere to slow down or reverse global warming. And I want to start on the right-hand side of, uh, of this uh, figure. Uh, there are what we call natural means of carbon dioxide removal. We know that we can plant trees uh, or restore forests, enhance forests, and of course they, uh, they draw CO2 out of the atmosphere as they grow. Uh, farming practices, good uh, restorative farming practices can maintain or enhance the amount of carbon that is actually stored in soil. So those are two very important pieces uh, of, this, uh, of this puzzle. Then there are what we call the technological methods of carbon dioxide removal. Uh, one is called bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, sometimes referred to as VEX. And that's where a, a plants are grown in a dedicated fashion to then actually be used to be burned uh, to, for, for industry or for power production. And once those, so first those plants have drawn CO2 out of the atmosphere, then you use it as an input, you burn it, but then you capture uh, the, the CO2 uh, and put it in geologic storage. So you draw it out and uh, combust it and then store it. Uh, the other major technological means that we can currently conceive of is called direct air capture and storage or referred to as DACs. Here, uh, we are literally creating machines that draw ordinary air into a process and the CO2 is removed from the air, even at its relatively small concentration, 400, 430 parts uh, per million, uh, it can be done. And once that CO2 is concentrated, again, you transport it and put it in a geologic, uh, secure geologic uh, area. So the, the, the common elements here in carbon capture is uh, between both carbon capture and storage and carbon dioxide removal by technological means is the capture process, the transportation process, the storage. We can also imagine some utilization uh, efforts probably won't be a huge player in this, uh, but perhaps a niche player to help us build, use the CO2 to help produce carbon fiber, mix it with cement and other aggregates to make actually better cement. Uh, you can use it to enhance uh, oil and gas recovery, make chemicals, even put it in beer and Coca-Cola. But uh, those, these applications on the grand scheme of things will probably be niche players. Most of this uh, captured CO2 would have to be put uh, underground. So those are the techniques. How do they relate to the big picture 
of deep decarbonization pathways. And this slide, some of you may be familiar with if uh, you peruse the documents and reports put out by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is uh, the uh, famous graph from the report that came out in 2018 that charted pathways to stay at 1.5 degrees warming or lower. And uh, they reviewed the many dozens upon dozens of, of modeling exercises that show what do we need to do to global emissions to, uh, to stay at safe uh, levels. Sort of the, the bluish part keeps us at 1.5 degrees. Uh, the grayish parts models keep us at, uh, at two, two degrees or below. Uh, but the important thing about this graph is just first of all to note that we're at a roughly 40 billion tons of CO2 per year currently. And we have to get on a very steep slope of decline globally to get down to roughly zero net emissions by 2050 in order to preserve a safe climate. The less success we have on this, the more gradual glide path we get on reducing emissions, then we're gonna be at two degrees or three degrees or God forbid four, four or five degrees. So this is a pretty daunting challenge to get there, but it is within our grasp. If we're smart and we put and we gather the political will to do it, there's sort of three basic takeaways on how on these pathways. One is, as you can imagine, we need major transformations across all sectors of the economy. Power generation, buildings, transportation, and industry. All of those need to be transformed in a way to reduce emissions to get to net zero by around 2050. The second thing, just to, to digress for a little bit on, on renewable electricity, uh, as I'm sure everyone knows, uh, the cost of renewable electricity has plummeted recently. It's fantastic news. Over the last decade, uh, 70, 80, 90% decreases in the cost of wind and solar. And that means that we can probably have a very heavy renewable electricity grid in the future. Uh, however, getting to 100% is uh, not, uh, most people don't think that's possible either on reliability grounds or affordability grounds. So a lot of the global modeling here uh, that the IPCC reviewed sees the world getting to 60, 80% wind and solar. And then after that, a mixture of hydro, nuclear, and uh, uh, electricity generation with uh, carbon capture. Again, this is gonna vary somewhat by, by country. US studies reach, uh, typically reach a similar conclusion. The third big takeaway is that sadly, we are very likely to overshoot safe levels of concentration. We'll try to get to net zero by 2050, but beginning around there or even earlier, we will actually need to start removing CO2 from the atmosphere to try to keep warming at safe levels. So these, what we call the P1, P2, P3, P4 sort of illustrative pathways, which we'll dive, do a little deeper dive here in a minute, uh, all show either modest or large amounts of actually sucking CO2 back out of the atmosphere to keep a safe planet. <clears throat> uh, just to talk about those transformations for a second across all sectors of the economy, uh, the, th this slide uh, from a US study summarizes well the sort of four basic strategies we need to get to, to zero carbon uh, by, by mid-century. I'd like to start with the second one here which is first, across all end uses, we need to be as energy efficient as possible in our buildings, in our transportation vehicles, in our industry. And we, we know how to do this. We know we can dramatically reduce, say, the energy use per dollar of GDP. The second big strategy is, across all those end uses, try to electrify as many as possible. And we're starting to do this already. We are starting to electrify our cars and our SUVs and our medium duty trucks. Uh, we can eventually uh, move that also to electrifying our buildings to a greater extent. Right now we burn a lot of natural gas and fuel oil to heat uh, our buildings and, and for hot water. 
we can actually switch those to electric heat pumps, electric water heaters, et cetera. We can also electrify various things in industry or use electricity to create hydrogen uh, for industry. So that's our, uh, our second strategy. Our third strategy, as you can imagine, we're gonna be use, needing a lot more electricity in this transformation. So we need to build a lot of zero carbon electricity generation uh, as we phase out uh, gas and coal and, and the emissions that they uh, use. <clears throat> so that's the third strategy. The fourth strategy coming back to the topic of focus today is carbon capture. We will probably need some carbon capture for industry sources I, that I said we can't uh, use electricity or hydrogen. We probably need some for the power sector and we're probably gonna have to simply remove some of the CO2 that I, we already put in the atmosphere. So those are the sort of four big tasks to get onto that, the, the pathways we need to get to net zero. So now I'm gonna do kind of a geeky dive back to this slide that um, the, the thrust of which is to uh, give you uh, my opinion, also shared by, by many people in this field on why we really are going to need to create this carbon dioxide removal option. Uh, as I said before, uh, all of our pathways to net zero are probably gonna require either some minor carbon dioxide removal or some major carbon dioxide removal. And I'm gonna make the case to you that uh, it's probably gonna be a major task, not a, not a small task, and here's why. What this slide shows also from, from the IPCC is you can see it's, it's the, these four breakdowns are, are sort of the same uh, general shape here. This literally just takes out the P1, P2, P3, 4 scenarios of how emissions have to decrease sharply in these scenarios. Uh, but in P1, they, they decrease really fast early on. And then, you know, we, we do that decrease uh, a little bit more slowly across P2, P3, P4. And the key thing that I want you to zero in on here is that uh, the, the brown and the yellow shaded areas show us the kind of carbon dioxide removal that the IPCC put into these models of how to get there. They call the natural means of carbon dioxide removal shaded in brown, goes by another acronym, sorry, AFALU. This is changing agriculture, forestry, and land use to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, just like I talked about trees and, and, and soils. The technological means to do this is represented in yellow. In this particular analysis, the IPCC just labeled all that yellow a technological means BEX, what we talked about in an earlier slide, the bioenergy with carbon capture and, and, uh, and storage. But in, in truth, it could also be the DAX. It could be the direct air capture and storage. Some means beyond the natural means that involves uh, the, the technology of capturing and, and storing uh, the, the emissions. So you can see, see here that as we go from P1 to, to P4, you need increasing amounts of the yellow. You need the technological means to remove the CO2 from the atmosphere. Some of my friends in, in the environmental community say, gee, we really like P1 the best because we don't like this technological means of, of, the, yellow, of the yellow stuff. So let's, let's try to do P1 or maybe P2 because it only requires a little bit of that te technological means. And I'm concerned about that because the next slide shows what happen, has to happen to energy consumption across these four scenarios. And again, stick with me here. I know this, uh, this is a, a lot of information, but um, this is a, really the nub for me. What this, what this graph shows across, again, those same four scenarios the IPCC put together, shows us our total primary energy use across the whole globe. With this dotted line at about 600, what's called exajoules, this is where we are now. And the P1 and P2 scenarios 
have us immediately cutting global energy use dramatically in just 10 years by 2030, as shown here and shown here, and then keeping it low or shrinking across 2050, 2100, 2050, 2100. That's a pretty risky bet to, to believe that, that, that we're capable of doing that. More likely, in my view, is that we're probably going to be on a trajectory similar to P3 or P4, where maybe we can hold global energy use sort of constant, like in P3, or have some growth by 2030, and probably some additional growth as we go forward, particularly in the developing countries uh, as, they, uh, as they grow uh, and, ex and expand. So P3 and P4, in my view, are much more likely, or at least we need to be prepared to deal with that kind of growth in energy use, which means we're going to need these technological means. And again, that, that's a conclusion. Again, I'm trying to be you know, very, very transparent, not shared by everyone, but I would say that that's a fairly mainstream uh, conclusion among energy analysts. So what's my bottom line? I believe there really is a carbon capture imperative. We need to develop this technology, the capture part, the pipelines for transport, and the geological injection sites. That's because I am near certain that we're going to need it to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the decades ahead to keep a safe climate. The bioenergy option might be helpful, uh, although we got to make sure it doesn't compete with food production or, or uh, uh, destroy biodiversity. The direct air capture and storage is, in my view, the only really scalable option on the horizon, although scientists are working on other options too. I believe it's near certain that we're going to need carbon capture and storage to reduce our industrial emissions. There's some that are just not feasible to reduce in other ways. Uh, so that's a near certainty. The role in the power sector, it's more up in the air. I think it's likely to be useful. Uh, having a dispatchable uh, gas plant with carbon capture up to 90, 100% removal would be useful to balance the intermittency of sun and wind when sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. But there's also batteries and other, other options, but it's probably a good option to have uh, as an arrow in our quiver. Um, these views of the, the likely role, I just want to say they were shared by uh, the last administration, the Obama administration, when it put out its strategy for deep decarbonization. Uh, it's cited as, as needed uh, in this report done last year for the Our Children's Trust a lawsuit uh, called 350 PPM Pathways. And if you look at the report that came out this year by the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, um, again, a lot of discussion of the need to develop carbon capture uh, for power, for industry, and for the task of carbon removal. Uh, needless to say, there hasn't been an update on the Obama strategy because over the last four years, there hasn't been too much interest in uh, deep decarbonization, but hopefully that will change under a Biden administration. Uh, I'll stop there. We can talk ab about arguments on the other side of this debate. Uh, is there a moral hazard in uh, deploying carbon capture and storage or, or CDR? I don't believe there is one. Uh, there are other ar arguments that come out of the uh, some among some environmental NG NGOs and some EJ voices, uh, but I, I really look look forward to engaging with you uh, on those. Uh, thanks for this chance. For this chance. Great, thank you, Carl. Um, we're going to hold for questions after everyone has had a chance to do presentations. So I hope you're taking notes, having your questions ready. Um, but I have Ugbad Kosar who will um, present next. So Ugbad, Ugbad, the uh, floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. All right, can everybody see my slides? Yep, you're good to go. Perfect, okay, thank you all. Um, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak here today, Tina. Uh, my name is Ugbad Kosar, so you did say my last name right. Um, and I'm a senior policy advisor at Carbon 180. Before I dive into carbon removal, um, I do just wanna share a little bit about the organization that I work at and what we do. 
Uh, Carbon 180 is a climate organization. We're an NGO based in uh, DC and we focus just on carbon removal. So we have three different focus areas or the way that we approach um, our, our work. Uh, so the science and the research part of it, just making sure that um, what we do work on and what we champion uh, is rooted in you know, the latest uh, and greatest, I guess, science. Um, we do have a small business shop, uh, probably the smallest part of our team, but we work with um, budding entrepreneurs typically that are thinking about getting into the carbon removal space um, and engaging in that space. Um, and then uh, the biggest part of our work, which is new for us, is the policy shop. So about two years now, we've been really shifting our focus into the policy advocacy work. And we primarily work on um, the federal level, uh, so federal policy. And we work on both technological and on land-based or um, natural carbon removal solutions. Um, we're a relatively young organization. And one thing that we're trying to do um, is to ensure that even though we're championing carbon removal solutions for the climate crisis, um, we're making sure that we're championing equitable and sustainable uh, options. So one thing that we're trying to do is build out um, our environmental justice program, which I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about during Q&A. Um, but ultimately, we're recognizing that even though models and all of this stuff tells us that carbon removal is really important, um, the carbon removal policy space and just climate policy space in general, is it's not neutral, it's inherently political. Um, and so if we have default structures and uh, policies that are in place now and like regulations and funding and decision-making processes, they're just going to further harm frontline communities. Um, so continuing business as usual for uh, carbon removal uh, is just not gonna cut it. Um, and an elephant in the room, which I want to be fully transparent about and hopefully we can discuss is that some forms of carbon removal uh, are tied up with extractive industries, right? So industries like oil and gas that have not only contributed to climate change, but also have driven, as I'm sure everyone in this group is already well aware of, um, racial, social health inequities, human rights violations. Um, and one thing that we strongly champion and that we believe in is we do believe in carbon removal and we think it's really important, but we wanna make sure that we're not allowing these industries to shape the narrative and, and the stage of how it's going to be deployed and what's gonna happen with, the, with these technologies. So we're trying to push back and have us as a community set the standards um, and the demands that we want for, for carbon removal. Okay, that was a lot. Um, so why do we work on carbon removal? I know that uh, it was just mentioned, but just wanna reiterate that uh, there are a number of you know, models and, and um, the IPCC report that shows um, in order for us to stay below the 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, we need to heavily rely on massive amounts of carbon removal uh, just to ensure that we don't pass dangerous uh, temperature dark targets. But um, the carbon removal approaches uh, need to be a part of a bigger uh, climate policy strategy. So that's alongside rapid reductions and emissions, which is most important, and adaptation to different climate impacts. Um, and then I just pulled out this quote from the IPCC special report that just reiterates to what scale that we're gonna need it, which is on the order of 100 to 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide removal over the, the 21st century. Um, and again, I know that we just kind of went through this, so I'm gonna try to um, be really brief uh, at this part, but. At its core, carbon removal is referring to practices and technologies that draw carbon down from the atmosphere. So specifically carbon that has already been um, emitted. And I just wanted to show this uh, chart to just highlight that there's very diverse set of approaches um, and they all have their own different costs or level of readiness or resource needs or you know, storage potential. And they each have their own environmental and social impacts. So it's just really important to keep in mind that carbon removal isn't just one thing, but just so many different um, approaches and, and practices and technologies. Um, as it was mentioned, you can kind of divide it into two areas. So we have our you know, natural side over here, um, things like restoring and protecting coastal wetlands or protecting and managing forests, adopting regenerative uh, farming practices, which I'll um, get into a little bit. And also, the technology side, which is really just trying to mimic what nature already does, right, through photosynthesis, which is that drawdown of the carbon, and then storing it or using it for, for other products. 
just given time and also the fact that we're really focusing on um, you know, priorities for the, the Biden administration in particular, I do wanna just focus on the approaches that are the most prominent solutions or the ones that are really up and coming. So forests, regenerative farming, direct air capture, geologic storage and carbon utilization. Those are probably the highest uh, priority or at least the ones that are being spoken of the most right now. And I know I just want to reiterate again um, that carbon removal is important because we can help remove uh, residual emissions. So from these hard to decarbonize sectors, I mean, heavy industry, agriculture, transportation, it's gonna be really hard to get those um, decarbonized. And then also we already have a ton of carbon in the atmosphere. So also using these processes to draw down that legacy emissions. But I, I really want to emphasize, um, and I think it's really, really important that we um, center the fact that aggressive and rapid emissions reduction uh, has to remain central and that with that carbon removal will be necessary. So even if we decarbonize immediately. Um, okay, I won't spend too much time because I know we spoke about direct air capture, but this is the most prominent of the technological carbon removal approaches, um, direct air capture or DAC as I'll probably call it. Um, DAC is an engineered system. It pulls carbon out of the ambient air um, that can then be used or uh, stored. So generally how this works is that uh, carbon dioxide is chemi ke like chemically binds to the material in these cylinders in the photo. Um, and then it can be collected in like a really concentrated form for transport to either use or um, for storage facility to permanently sequester the emissions. Um, the potential climate benefit for DAC is massive as we saw um, and at scale it could reduce multiple gigatons of carbon dioxide by mid-century um, and also uh, provide a number of uh, thousands of jobs um, in communities. It's in its earlier phases of development. So right now it still remains pretty expensive. Um, and oh, and uh, uh, this could likely change or should likely change um, as the technology evolves. Um, but that would take significant uh, investment in time and in finances. Um, Director Capture also needs quite a bit of energy to run, which is really, really important to mention. Um, which in turn would require a lot of resources like land or water, depending on what is going to be powering it. And there's also still a lot of infrastructure needs, which were also emphasized, so transportation, use, storage, all really important components of direct air capture. Um, and again, we spoke quite a bit about this, so I won't get into it too much, but to store carbon uh, permanently underground, the main type of storage is, uh, geologic, is in geologic reservoirs. So these are known as um, saline aquifers. Um, so CO2 can be injected into these reservoirs and due to the geology of, of what's chosen, can permanently lock it in. Um, there is relatively low, low risk of um, leakage of the carbon dioxide, both in the air and in surrounding geology. Um, and there's also more than enough of this geologic capacity in the US. What's missing right now are those policies and the regulations to allow for sustainable and safe growth of, of this field. Um, there's also another mechanism I, that I've, I've heard of, which is to store CO2, um, store CO2 uh, to inject it into like a different kind of geologic system where it, it mineralizes the CO2 um, and like turns it into a rock essentially, which is also permanent um, or has no leakage. There's also, there's also, um, there's also carbon tech. You lost your PowerPoint. Oh. It's nice to see you. <laughs> Let me try to reshare that. Sorry about that. How about now? How about now? We see your screen. Okay, perfect. Let me just make sure I present. Thank you, Gina. Is it good? Yep, you're all good. Okay, thank you. Um, another way to uh, use the, the carbon after it's been captured is to lock it in a way using um, materials. So this is what we coined as carbon tech. Um, so you can create things like uh, building materials or fuels um, or chemicals using captured carbon. And really just depending on um, the source of the carbon or the conversion process that's used 
Um, and then also the resulting product. There are a, a range of different markets um, as well as different climate benefits. So building materials, for example, um, have the potential to store carbon dioxide for a really long time, and they also create value. Another type is fuel. Um, so using CO2 to um, create fuel, it wouldn't reduce any emissions, to be honest, but could help us create, um, you know, like net zero fuels for those hard to decarbonize sectors like aviation. Um, if you look at the graphic here, it looks at the potential reduction in CO2 emissions. Um, if you look at the light blue circle, this is the potential reduction um, without any strategic action. So without any like extra policies that are gonna be put in place to help this uh, scale up. And then in the dark blue circle, this is if there are strategic actions that are implemented, this is the possibility that it has. So you can see the aggregates is pretty high up there. I do also just want to mention um, enhanced oil recovery, which was mentioned previously. Um, this is where you uh, inject carbon dioxide into a depleted oil well um, to help recover even more oil. Um, while the bulk of CO2 does remain underground during this process, the oil that is recovered um, will be combusted and then lead to more emissions. Um, truthfully, this has been a controversial use of carbon dioxide and not really a pathway that carbon 180 is, um, is comfortable in, in promoting just given the nature of, of what it is. Um, but I, I just, transparency wise, just wanna mention that that is one reason that um, captured carbon is being used for. Where does director capture exist now? Um, if you look at those orange squares, this is where there's currently um, plants that are um, up and running from three prominent um, companies. And then these uh, open squares that aren't filled in are some of the demonstration projects that are up and coming. So um, one thing I just wanna flag is that uh, we definitely need more geographic diversity. Um, and then also to build both the technological and governance capacity um, in the global south for those those that are interested in pursuing direct air capture. Okay, switching gears a little bit. Um, I do also wanna talk about a couple of the main land-based approaches or natural climate solutions. They are kind of used interchangeably. Um, these are things like forestry, like I mentioned, or agriculture or wetlands. Um, these practices are mostly ready to be deployed. Uh, they're relatively low risk and low cost. Um, as you can see, they also have significant climate mitigation potential and reforestation is right here at the top. Um, but I just, again, I wanna emphasize it's important that we don't oversell or undersell these approaches. They do have um, climate mitigation potential, um, but they also do have their own limitations as well. So there's forestry, um, trees, they're natural carbon removal machines. Um, they can remove and store uh, a lot of carbon dioxide. Roughly one third of the US is, is forested um, and captures um, quite a bit of the country's uh, CO2 emissions. Some of the approaches when it comes to forestry in the carbon removal context is um, planting more trees. So that's afforestation or reforestation. Um, it can be restoring forests to improve um, health and productivity. Um, or using different management practices that can help maximize that tree growth. Um, a lot of these are known and, and honestly, most of them are deployed today. And a lot of these forestry projects um, are in response to disturbances to things like, like wildfires and pest outbreaks that are getting worse um, with climate change. Um, and the trees have a number of co-benefits, you know, they improve air quality and they can help mitigate flooding, droughts, um, support biodiversity, filter water, um, lots of job opportunities in there as well. But there are limits to how much carbon is stored in forests. So stored carbon can be released back into the atmosphere from disturbance. So if there's wildfire, like I mentioned, or logging practices that happen. And so maintaining and protecting the carbon in forests is just as important as increasing it and, and planting those trees in the first place. Um, we also need really robust um, monitoring, reporting, and verification to accurately measure how much carbon is actually stored in these systems. And this is really important because all of these tree planting initiatives that are coming up uh, these days um, and just that general interest in monetizing forest carbon. So just wanna be really careful about what we're selling, what they are selling, not what we are selling. Um, regenerative agriculture is, is another approach. So carbon is naturally stored in soils um, over time and you know soils can be really 
powerful tools for addressing climate and sometimes are really uh, overlooked. So some of these approaches on in agriculture are um, things like things that um, increase the amount of carbon that's in the soil and then also help reduce the amount of soil disturbance that happens. So some of these practices that are up here like conservation tillage, managing grazing or planting perennials um, are all different ways that you can improve or increase um, soil carbon storage. Um, they also have their own co-benefits. I mean, it can improve soil health and the long-term productivity of, of a land. Um, and this is important because it can help producers meet growing food demands uh, without having to convert additional agricultural land. So without having to chop down trees and forests um, to meet this demand. Um, it also reduces the reliance on fertilizers, which I think is important, which can improve things like water and, and air quality. Um, the upfront cost for this can be really high. It can be a really significant barrier to um, even implement these practices in the first place. Also similar to forests, there are limits to how much carbon can be stored in um, soil. And soil carbon can also just be released back into the atmosphere if those practices are changed or if that soil is um, disturbed. So again, maintaining soil carbon is just as important as working to increase it. And we also need robust um, monitoring, reporting, and verification to accurately measure how much carbon is actually being stored um, in these different contexts. And again, this is important because we're seeing a lot of like growing interest to pay for the soil carbon sequestered in agricultural systems and like really tying it into like tons per CO2. So really important. And I know we already talked about carbon removal versus CCS. Um, I do just want to emphasize this again. Carbon removal is often mixed with carbon capture and storage. Um, so CCS is like point source um, of emissions, like power plants and industrial plants that we talked about, obviously can also be tied into direct air capture. Um, but carbon removal, when we say that, is specifically ambient air that we're talking about. Um, and there are some infrastructure overlaps between direct air capture and CCS. So again, that transportation piece and the storage piece. Um, so I just want to make that really clear. And then geoengineering is another one that I've heard a lot um, being used for, for to describe carbon removal. So it's sort of like this umbrella term for geoengineering, uh, sorry, for carbon removal and solar geoengineering. Um, soil geoengineering, solar geoengineering, it's a mouthful, um, involves methods to reflect sunlight to cool the plant, uh, the planet. Um, these are just a really different set of technologies, both in like science and in governance needs and just even in our level of understanding. Um, and in recent years, as the need for carbon removal has just really become more apparent, carbon removal and solar geoengineering have really moved forward on really different paths. Um, and the only thing that these really have in common is the need for robust governance. So I just want to make clear that we only focus on that carbon removal piece and, and not geoengineering at all. Lastly, um, current policy landscape. Um, this isn't you know, a niche topic that we're just talking about. It actually is gaining a lot of traction here in the US and around the world. Um, the IPCC report that was mentioned earlier, it really turned heads, honestly, including mine. Um, and then the National Academies of Science, they released this like federal agenda, uh, federal research agenda for carbon removal. And it really highlighted um, the potential of these different approaches um, and then also those research needs that would be needed to get there. Um, and so with funding, until recently, carbon removal received honestly little to no funding. For contacts before um, 2019, the DOE spent about $11 million on direct air capture like ever in the history of the DOE. Um, after that NAS report was released the following year, Funding went up to $35 million on direct air capture. Um, and then this year it went up to $40 million and then they just awarded another $22 million. So just one example to show that we're seeing increases across the board. It's not just for direct air capture, it's for a whole host of the, uh, the approaches. In addition to funding, um, we're seeing a lot of bills being introduced at the federal level and um, congressional hearings as well on, on these carbon removal approaches or these negative emissions technologies. Um, one that I just want to mention is something called the CREATE Act. It was introduced both in the Senate and in the House um, to help ensure coordination across all the federal agencies on um, all of the different carbon removal solutions. So bills like this are coming up that are taking this like multi-agency economy-wide effort. 
Um, and then also it was mentioned how select committee, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, the Green New Deal does mention low tech carbon removal solutions on the natural side. So things like afforestation and soil carbon storage. Biden Sanders Unity Task Force, there was a lot of details on negative emissions technologies there. And even if you look at the appointments on um, the Biden transition team, it does show some nods to perhaps carbon removal becoming a priority. And so what to expect in the administration? Um, I think carbon removal is supposed to be a priority and something that is going to um, come up pretty often in this new administration, both for administrative and for congressional actions. Um, and there's also major infrastructure requirements and conversations that need to be had. So like direct air capture plants, transportation and storage, carbon use facilities and applications. Um, and so all of this just to say that carbon removal is, it is moving along. Um, it's growing in interest, um, in investment and in deployment. But I think it's still early on or still early enough and nascent enough for us to really shape what this is going to look like. Um, and how are we going to find ways to actually maximize those benefits? Um, I think the biggest thing is conversations like these where we're able to talk about what carbon removal is and all these other approaches, um, and then find ways to just get people to be more informed or involved and engaged in carbon removal. I think that's about it for me. But thank you all. Thank you all. Great, thank you, Ugba. That was really wonderful. And um, I always learn something new when I hear this presentation. Um, so we're gonna turn now to Rosalie from um, the Environment Defense Fund. Um, Rosalie, you are up uh, presentation. Uh, great, thanks so much, Tina. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, let me try to share my screen here. Okay, um, no. so, uh, so just to start off, uh, my name is Rosalie Wynn. I'm an attorney with the Environmental Defense Fund based in Colorado. I've been with EDF now for just over four years and my work focuses on reducing methane and other air pollution from the oil and gas sector. Uh, the work is personal for me. Um, air pollution from oil and gas is a major issue here in Denver where I live. Uh, ozone alerts for unhealthy smog levels um, caused by emissions from oil and gas production just north of the city are a regular feature of summer here. <clears throat> uh, so before turning to methane, I just wanted to provide a little bit of background on EDF. Uh, we were founded by a group of scientists and lawyers in the 1960s in New York. Um, who recognized that the spraying of the pesticide DDT was threatening local osprey populations. Uh, I'm sorry, but we lost your screen. I got you. I found it. <laughs> I agree. Um, so um, EDF uh, eventually succeeded. In, I'm not sure what's happening here. Um, EDF eventually uh, succeeded in getting a DDT banned nationwide. Um, and ever since then, our advocacy has really been rooted in science and economics, uh, with a focus on leveraging data uh, to develop solutions for environmental challenges, um, now including the climate crisis, uh, the energy transition to clean energy, um, healthy communities, and sustainable ecosystems. And our work depends on building partnerships with other organizations, on impacted communities, and other stakeholders. Uh, I'm here to talk mostly about methane, uh, but before we get into that, just wanted to note that methane is one um, important piece, um, but just one piece of EDF strategy for addressing the climate crisis. Uh, so we're working to bend the curve by slowing, stopping, and reversing greenhouse gas emissions uh, from oil and gas production, as well as uh, oil and gas use by 2030, uh, while meeting the world's energy needs cleanly and equitably. Uh, so that includes working on uh, the energy transition in transportation, a shift to clean vehicles, and, and eventually 
uh, clean heavy duty trucks, um, as well as the shift in the power sector to clean energy generation. Uh, we also view all of these emissions reductions through a multi-pollutant lens. Uh, in addition to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we need to reduce emissions of harmful, harmful co-pollutants that can also damage local air quality. Okay, uh, so turning to methane. Uh, methane is a powerful short-term climate pollutant. Um, it just lasts for a fraction of time in the atmosphere compared to CO2. Um, but during that time, it's more than 80 times more potent um, than carbon dioxide on a pound for pound basis in terms of global warming impact over a 20 year period. And methane is responsible for a huge chunk of the warming that we are experiencing today, as well as associated climate impacts like stronger hurricanes in the Gulf and wildfires and smoke out West. Uh, we know that the impacts of today's climate change are falling disproportionately on already overburdened communities, including communities of color. Um, and we can see the cascading impacts of climate change compounding historical environmental injustices uh, during situations like Hurricane Harvey and its impact in Houston, uh, where cancer causing benzene emissions uh, spiked following the storm um, from refineries uh, in, in the city there. Um, methane uh, is the primary component of natural gas and is frequently leaked, uh, intentionally released or flared or burned during oil and gas production. And EDF is focused on reducing methane from the oil and gas sector as the largest industrial source of these emissions. Until relatively recently, um, fairly little was known about where leaks are occurring uh, or what the best way was to fix them. So in 2012, EDF kicked off a research series to better pinpoint leaks and to find solutions. Uh, EDF scientists collaborated with researchers from universities across the country uh, to release over the past few years, um, dozens of studies and data sets documenting the source of methane emissions in the United States. Um, EDF is also working now on identifying and quantifying uh, the health impacts of local air pollution from the oil and gas industry. Um, our health scientists are currently working with Harvard and the University of North Carolina on a paper to be released in the next couple of months uh, that will assess the health benefits, uh, like the number of asthma attacks that can be reduced uh, from cutting uh, local air pollution associated with the oil and gas industry. So in 2018, EDF drew from our methane studies to publish a synthesis of methane emissions across the entire US supply chain uh, to show how much leaks at every step of the process uh, from the production of oil and gas uh, at well sites uh, to the transportation um, and, and storage of uh, natural gas through, through pipelines through the country. Um, and finally, uh, when uh, gas is distributed through utilities um, to local homes and to businesses. Uh, so altogether, the oil and gas sector emits at least 13 million metric tons of methane each year. Uh, this is 60% higher than EPA um, has estimated is leaked by the oil and gas industry and it's enough wasted gas to fuel um, 10 million homes for a year. Uh, the bulk of this uh, pollution occurs at well sites and nearby facilities during oil and gas production uh, from leaks, from inefficient equipment or poorly controlled storage tanks. Um, and these are problems that can be addressed with current technology at relatively low costs. Um, <clears throat> So along with methane, uh, oil and gas wells emit harmful local pollution, like volatile organic compounds, which contribute to ground level ozone or smog, as well as hazardous air pollutants like cancer causing benzene. Uh, and, and this pollution occurs in communities all across the country. Um, but there, because there are so many well sites, there are over 900,000 active oil and gas wells in the United States today. Uh, it can be kind of tough to conceptualize the direct impacts of local air pollution from oil and gas development. Uh, so the image on the screen is from an interactive map that EDF developed of where these wells are. 
uh, the walls are the, the blue dots on the screen and how close they are to where people live. Uh, the orange and yellow shading uh, represents the population density of nearby communities. Oh, not seeing your screen. Oh. Sorry about that. I can see it. Yeah, we can see it. I, it's it's visible for me on mm -hmm. this. Well. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> You're great. Um, just uh, Zoom reality. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so. I have the technological difficulties are real. Um, uh, so um, the the map is available at EDF dot org slash federal methane map. Um, I encourage everyone to, to check it out if you're interested. Um, in addition to mapping the locations of wells, it also um, includes information on the demographics of nearby um, communities and neighborhoods. And we also uh, estimate how much pollution can be reduced uh, with more protective federal standards. Uh, so that uh, brings us to the current federal methane policy landscape. Um, in 2016, the EPA under the Obama administration adopted rules to address air pollution from, the oil, and, from oil and gas facilities that were built or modified after 2015. Uh, these so-called new source rules um, include common sense requirements to cut both methane and smog forming volatile organic compound um, emissions uh, across the upstream um, or production, gathering and boosting um, and gas processing uh, segments of the industry, as well as the midstream segment, um, gas transmission and storage infrastructure like pipelines. Uh, these rules were always intended to be a first step to reduce methane and other pollution uh, with a second set of rules to control emissions from older or so-called existing oil and gas facilities to come later. Uh, but in summer of 2020, uh, the Trump EPA finalized rules to uh, eliminate all methane standards across the oil and gas supply chain, uh, exempt facilities in the midstream uh, transmission and storage segment of the industry from regulation entirely, uh, prevent any future uh, federal regulation of pollution from these older existing facilities, um, including more than 800,000 oil and gas wells built before 2015. And then finally, uh, to weaken the remaining VOC only standards for new upstream facilities, uh, including exempting tens of thousands of new wells from leak inspection requirements. Uh, so really a wholesale rollback of the Obama era methane standards um, cumulatively, these EPA rollbacks, uh, if left in place, will allow dramatic additional climate and air pollution um, from the oil and gas industry, EDF, uh, and a number of other health, environmental, and community organizations have sued uh, to halt these changes, um, and we're you know, hopeful that uh, the incoming Biden administration will, will sort of take swift action um, to address the, the Trump rollbacks. Um, I also wanted to note the Department of Interior's 2016 waste prevention rule, uh, which reduced the waste of natural gas and corresponding methane and local air pollution uh, from oil and gas development that occurs on federal and tribal lands. Um, that rule is currently tied up in litigation, uh, but we will be urging the Biden administration to um, resume a strong defense of these protections which have important implications for tribal communities in particular, uh, living with federally managed oil and gas development. Uh, so what's up next? Um, we really see a uh, immediate and, and uh, major opportunity for advancing methane policy in the incoming Biden administration. Uh, we'll be pushing the Biden EPA to restore strengthen and expand oil and gas methane standards uh, predominantly through administrative rulemakings uh, undertaken by EPA. Uh, the emissions reductions um, represented here on the slide represent uh, modest regulation by EPA, um, restoring the Obama era standards for, for new sources and extending similar rules to existing sources. Uh, 
but we're hopeful that we can push for even more ambitious standards and even steeper reductions. Uh, we envision reducing methane emissions by 45 to 65% from 2012 levels by 2025 uh, by strengthening the new source requirements and expanding productions uh, to the currently unregulated set of existing older oil and gas facilities. Uh, these ambitious reductions correspond to up to 9.2 million tons of methane reduced in 2025. Uh, that has the near-term climate impact of taking up to 170 million cars off of the road for a year, uh, along with reductions of up to 2.6 million tons of volatile organic compounds um, that uh, contribute to smog and nearly um, 100,000 tons of, of hazardous air pollutants like benzene. And uh, strong federal methane rules, we think will also have important um, and, and tangible benefits for local communities. Uh, more than 9 million people in the United States live within half a mile of an active oil and gas, oil or gas well site. Uh, and the vast majority of these people live within half a mile of one of the uh, hundreds of thousands of older oil and gas wells that have never been regulated by EPA. Uh, many of these people belong to groups uh, who are much more susceptible to the health impacts of air pollution from oil and gas, like children or seniors, as well as groups who have um, borne a, a disp disproportionate share historically um, of local air pollution, including communities of color and people living below the poverty line. Um, uh, so uh, in, in wrapping up, um, I just wanted to focus in on one of the areas that's impacted heavily by oil and gas pollution, uh, Southern California, um, and in particular, Los Angeles and uh, Ventura counties. Um, I think oil and gas development is, is often thought of as a rural issue, uh, but LA has one of the oldest oil fields in the country. Uh, and today, nearly half a million um, Los Angelinos live within half a mile of an active oil or gas well site. Uh, a half mile um, is a distance that scientific studies have repeatedly linked to increased health risks from oil and gas air pollution. Um, and this uh, pollution disproportionately impacts communities of color um, and in LA, uh, black communities in particular. Uh, so it, it might be a little bit tough to see, but um, on the map here, uh, the outlined areas in the counties uh, represent the areas within a half a mile of an active oil, <clears throat> oil well. And the shading uh, represents the proportion of the community that is black. Uh, so we can see that oil and gas uh, development in LA disproportionately occurs in black neighborhoods. Uh, and then just as a point of comparison, um, in less densely populated Ventura County uh, to the northwest of LA, uh, 25,000 people live within half a mile of an active well. Uh, and here we can see that uh, disproportionately impacted communities are predominantly Latino. So the populations um, impacted by oil and gas development vary county by county across the United States. Um, and again, kind of returning to our, our federal methane map, uh, you can explore county level impacts um, across the United States in the map. Um, and each community faces its uni own unique challenges. Um, EDF is also working to expand this type of analysis to other types of polluting facilities, including oil refineries, as well as heavy freight corridors. Um, and uh, if you're interested in uh, getting any specific data um, or have any uh, questions on, on any of the analysis that I've mentioned, um, would uh, encourage you to reach out. Um, would love to discuss any of that further um, and, and look forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Great, thank you so very much, um, Rosalie, for your presentation, um, as well as Ugbad and um, Carl. We have a few questions um, in the chat box, but I also want to encourage people to um, raise their hand um, so that I can also um, 
the um, that way as well. And um, I will start with the questions that we had in the chat box um, that came. And one of the questions uh, was about the uh, what about the ge geological storage areas, and isn't it better there than in the atmosphere? Um, that was one. I'm going to do two at a time. And uh, what are the uses for carbon for captured carbon since there's a chemical component? And does that usage create air, water, land pollution? And I think this is these two. These questions were for um, Ugbad or Carl. Ugbad, you want to go for those? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I can probably answer the second one first. Um, the uses for captured carbon, since there's a chemical component, um, and so does that usage create uh, air, water, or land pollution? Um, first of all, creating the products, they do share similar concerns as existing industrial facilities and operations. So usually they'd be sited um, alongside these facilities. And so there is the concern of them either prolonging um, it, the existence of, of, har of facilities. So um, just wanna emphasize that. Right now, there are smaller projects going on. Carbon utilization or, or carbon tech isn't like a really big industry just yet. Um, but those uh, ongoing projects or those impacts um, depend on the end use of the captured carbon. So what you're using it for. Um, I mentioned earlier that there were a couple different things that you can use it for. So it's like building materials. So it can replace things like cement or concrete um, or paving asphalt. Um, it can be uh, plastics as well, um, and then chemicals. And I think chemicals is one of the ones that was pulled out. So that's specifically like applications for um, carbon-based feedstocks for the production of things like formic acid or um, soda ash or carbon monoxide. Um, and I just want to emphasize that there can be absolutely um, different uh, land, air, and um, water pollution concerns. But given that it hasn't been really applied yet, um, it really just depends on where it's actually being cited or what it's actually being used for. Um, just for context in the US, the value of like the chemicals piece in particular um, of that market is really negligible um, given the order of all of the other markets. Um, and so this is a really long answer. Um, <laughs> basically just trying to figure out um, really depends on what you're actually creating, um, what the end product is, and what are the regulations around the actual facility itself. But the usage would be similar to if you are using cement for construction. I mean, there's still concerns about construction usage. There's still concerns about chemicals as well. So it's more so a way to reduce the emissions of those existing um, uh, applications. Is that helpful? I don't know if it was. Yeah. I can, um, I can comment on the um, on the logic uh, uh I think the questioner is is absolutely right that uh, I'd rather have it underground than in the air. I'd rather have it in the soil than in the air. I'd rather have it in a forest or a mangrove uh, rather than in the air. A absolutely, that that's that's uh, you know what the whole the idea of carbon dioxide removal uh, uh, strives for. Uh, Couple couple things to keep in mind. First, uh, that the underground storage uh, is not like uh, sort of like a balloon where you pump it down and, and you hope the balloon doesn't burst and all comes back up at once. But rather, when when the CO two is is pumped underground, it interacts with minerals underground and tends uh, and will 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 bond and 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 uh, become secure. There are there are there's potential for, for leakage. And I'm not an expert in this area, and, I, and Ugbad, please chime in if you've gone deeper on this topic uh, than than I have. But it's just important to realize that we have done this. Uh, particularly, um, Norway has been doing this for decades with some of its underground reservoirs offshore, uh, and also in the U.S. There's and the NAS I think has also endorsed the idea that 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 this is this is a a secure form of storage can no one can guarantee that nothing will ever leak out but it's certainly not uh, sort of like a dam ready to burst or a balloon ready to burst second thing uh, I'll also just note on on permanence 
I uh, think uh, Ugbad w went into uh, greater detail than I did on all the benefits of natural CDR, again, across different ecosystems when you can encourage plants uh, to uh, grow bigger and more numerous uh, than we have before. One also uh, needs to be cautionary too, particularly on the, on the element of trees. Uh, if climate change is drying up our forests and putting them at more risk of burning, we have to consider the permanence aspect of storing carbon in trees. It's a conundrum. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but it's just one of those worries we have to keep, uh, keep in mind. And we really need to protect those forests if we store a lot of carbon in them. Great, and another question um, that someone asked was is regarding the, um, of the plants that are up and running, how much carbon can one plant remove and how much does one plant cost to build? Yeah, so right now there um, are a couple different pilot plants. Um, the biggest one removes one metric ton a day. Um, and right now Carbon Engineering is one of the companies that's working on this. Um, they're working on um, a plant that would capture 1 million metric tons a year. Um, right now it's really expensive for a direct air capture plant uh, to be constructed and even to run. Um, it costs about like $600 per ton of carbon dioxide that's being removed. And given the scale that we're talking about, that's, that's a lot of money. So um, right now it's not feasible or, um, or affordable, but the goal is with uh, policies and um, incentives being put in place that you can bring that cost down to about $100 per ton of CO2 removed, which is a lot more affordable. But yeah, right now it's, it's really expensive and it's not getting nearly as much uh, carbon removal as you would actually need given the, uh, the models that we were talking about earlier. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, could I ask a follow-up to that? Yep, go ahead. Um, so, so what is the prognosis? Lost the audio. We just lost your. We just lost your audio. Um, so we didn't hear your question. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? So, given that these plants aren't removing, what is the prognosis for scaling up the technology so that this really becomes viable? Forgetting about cost for a second, just in terms of actual processing of of carbon out of the air. Mm -hmm. the amount and how quickly. I mean, is this technology that we think exists or technology that is going to need five years and five, to 10 years of development? Where is the time frame? I would, uh, I would, I would guess that it's, we're at least 10 years away from something that's sort of fully commercial. Uh, and uh, I think I, I've, uh, I've seen similar, similar numbers as uh, Ugbad cited where uh, the, these initial demonstrate small demonstration plants uh, may be able to pull CO2 out of the air for about $600 a ton, which is a very large number. But at any stage of a technology like this, uh, and engineers run, uh, run estimates on what if, what if we did this at scale? What if we created an industry that cranked out the technology uh, in large numbers and dropping that cost by a factor of, of two, three, four, five, six, maybe all the way down to $100 a ton is conceivable. Uh, just as we, you know, 10 years ago, wind and solar was pretty expensive. Uh, but for 10 years, we've done an incredible deployment strategy, uh, partly market driven, partly policy driven, that dropped the cost of solar and wind by 70 to 90%. Uh, so, uh, what would the, the the interesting thing here, I think, is to uh, to remember that a lot of innovation in the private sector is just market driven. You know, suddenly, uh, suddenly, no one has an iPhone or a smartphone. Ten years later, everybody has one. Market driven because customers want it. Here, it's a public good protecting the climate. It's not like consumers are individually clamoring for, hey, I want direct air capture. We need a policy framework that says we need to solve the climate problem. Direct air capture is one solution, uh, the natural solutions are another. So we need policies that take us to scale, bring us to from a demonstration to a fully commercialized project, product, 
and then costs will almost always fall. The extent to which they fall is, is a matter of projection and estimation. Thanks. Um, Thanks. Dana, Thanks. had your hand raised. So I, I just I just had a, a follow up question to for Carl about like the, the process. So like this notion of you take it out of the air and we can breathe better in theory. Um, <laughs> um, but if it goes in the ground and even if it bonds to the soil, doesn't that change the nature of the soil and could potentially impact like our food supply, like the system. Yeah, yeah. I should have emphasized that the we are, uh, current injection into oil and gas reservoirs, and then future injection will be even deeper into saline formations. That is so far underground; it would not uh, impact underground aquifers. It would not impact uh, uh, soil for farming. So uh, again, this has been deemed a you know. Uh, a, a safe a safe method of storing CO2 underground. I think we can be fairly, we can be fairly, fairly confident. Really confident. Um, I had a, thank you. I had a question actually, a methane question to pivot a bit. And the methane question I had was that, um, and this is Tina, just during the uh, campaign cycle, uh, Biden made it very clear that methane was on the, um, Sorry, fracking is on the table. Therefore, uh, methane um, methane um, pollution is also on the table. But that he believed that there would be there should be stronger regulations and that we should be capturing methane at the source. And Rosalie, I know you spoke about this. And I'm just curious if EDF or if anyone is really looking at what would that process be for methane capture and then how would it be used? Um, would it be resold is, you know, what's the regulation on the books or ideas for regulation and or legislation that might be coming our way through, uh, through with, a, with a Biden administration? Uh, absolutely, yeah, thank you, Tina, that's a great question. Um, and I think we, we are, Biden has, you know, emphasized that he, he views methane reduction is a sort of important near-term climate opportunity. So I think we're optimistic uh, that it will be, you know, something that the new administration prioritizes um, and, and, you know, recognizes the, the sort of critical kind of near-term benefit of, of cutting methane pollution. Um, um, the, the kind of like mechanics of uh, capture. So when we're, you know, I think most of the, the focus um, has been on oil and gas production and um, reducing uh, methane emissions at, at that stage. Uh, so when um, oil and gas is produced uh, frequently, um, you know, methane is just leaked um, in the form of just natural gas leaking out of um, the well site uh, through um, improperly uh, functioning equipment or, or poorly installed equipment. Um, and so the, the sort of capture is um, essentially just you know, stopping that leak, plugging it, fixing it, um, keeping that natural gas um, in, the, in the system uh, so that, you know, that methane, that natural gas does, you know, sort of continue to move through the system and eventually gets to uh, an end use, whether that is um, at this point, you know, being combusted in a, in a natural gas um, power plant or, you know, sent to homes and businesses to, to be used um, as, uh, as fuel there. Um, so that's sort of what, what kind of capture means um, right now. I think it, it's also important to um, note that like methane reduction doesn't sort of occur in a, in a vacuum. Um, I think we, recognize it needs to be paired with um, also driving down the demand for um, for natural gas and for oil um, and, and reducing fossil fuel consumption um, through things like the, the energy transition. Um, so that's that's sort of, uh, I think, the, the sort of dual prong strategy uh, that, that we're focused on, uh, you know, cutting um, emissions of, of methane um, from production as a, you know, important um, 
immediate step um, for, for reducing uh, climate pollution and then pairing it with um, ultimately reducing demand for, for fossil fuels. Thank you. Um, and we have a question that's asking about whether or not there are federal incentives here or in other countries that support coastal wetland expansion or maintenance by removing barriers to facilitate inland migration of the wetlands as sea level rise rises. Um, I'm not as familiar in other countries, um, but I know in the US there's next to no federal incentives that are in place right now. Um, so coastal wetlands are usually referred to um, or sometimes referred to as like blue carbon or blue carbon ecosystems. Um, and I know that this year there has been a lot more interest in building up the potential of blue carbon, whether it's protecting um, wetlands or restoring them, um, less so on the expansion piece. Um, and so there are a lot of um, bills in place that are trying to figure out where are these wetlands and mapping them out. Um, what would it would take for it to be restored and what would it take for it to be um, maintained and getting all of that in place. But uh, in terms of actual incentives in place right now, I there are next to none that I'm aware of. Um, was that someone asking a question or saying Dan Jones? <laughs> So I had a, a question um, about the environmental justice aspect of the um, the carbon sequestering, deep de deep decarbonization pathways, carbon removal, and Rosalie, I think you you started you, you did a good job of identifying the environmental justice um, impacts. But I'm I'm curious that in methane, it seems like that is something that's being thought about. Um, and looked into, and I am curious just if the three of you can actually weigh in on whether why um, EJ or an equity lens or an, a justice lens is either a part of the process for developing these policies, or if it's not, why or why not currently. That's a very broad question. I know. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to take, take I'll try to take a crack at it, uh, but I'm also just being very transparent. I uh, I am uh, I'm I'm not an expert in that in that intersection of, of EJ and deep decarbonization. And I think what's happened in the U.S. politically over the last year or two is that all of us uh, who are, are working in this area just are realizing we need we need to put that lens on. Uh, as well as the other ways we look, uh, we look at these these issues. The so I'll I'll say a couple of probably sort of random thoughts. Hopefully not not totally obvious, but the transformations that I that I talked about across all sectors of the economy uh, are are huge. There there will be a massive contraction of the fossil fuel industry. We've already seen that largely with coal. We're seeing it somewhat with oil, uh, although we're actually seeing, of course, an expansion of gas production through fracking, which has its its own uh, uh, impacts. But overall, there's going to be a contraction of the fossil fuel industry, probably with gas playing some transition role. Uh, but is it five years or 30 years or what? Hard, hard to predict. That's going to be shaped partly by policy. Uh, there are going to be industries that expand like crazy. The electric power industry will probably grow very rapidly. What kind of mix of plants? Is it all solar and wind? Is it solar and wind and the maintenance of some nuclear plants? Is it, is it eventually uh, the licensing and, a, and public approval of small modular reactors built in probably remote areas? Uh, we probably need to build a lot of transmission lines because frankly, nobody wants uh, uh, power plants too, too close to them anymore, perhaps with the exception of, of, of rooftop solar. Uh, there's gonna be an expansion of uh, you know, different, different kinds of vehicles and, and battery manufacturing. So all I'm saying to, to bring that thought to a close is there are gonna be some industries that expand like crazy and we need to 
make sure that those people living close by are not, not impacted. Any factory, whether it's a Tesla battery factory or uh, uh, a, a petrochemical plant has some impacts. Uh, so I think managing them and getting those local impacts down to a minimum as we decarbonize the economy is, is one key to this. Great, thanks, Carl. Um, oh, sorry, were you gonna move on, Tina? Okay. Um, I was just gonna say, I don't think there is um, an equity and justice uh, lens being applied in carbon removal right now, to be completely honest. Um, I find that carbon removal has this way of focusing solely on tons of carbon removed um, and doesn't really look at those integrated economic or social or environmental impacts on local communities. Um, you know, I've, I've been a number of conversations this past year. This is the first year I've really dove deep into carbon removal. Prior to that, I was um, forest scientist and just working on forestry. Um, and I haven't really heard equity and justice concerns being raised in conversations. Um, and there are maybe just a handful of researchers that are looking at like the social science aspects. So like, what are these actual impacts of carbon removal um, in local communities? And what is the history of those that are being involved in the conversation? And that is um, something that we, like I've, I've, I've noticed and I've recognized. And um, I know I mentioned that we're doing uh, an environmental justice um, program at work or we're, we're launching one. And a lot of that has been because there, there aren't any conversations. And when we look at who's at the table or who's making decisions, whether it's what solutions are being deployed um, from the outset, not even deployed, but what research, what, what research and development is being implemented or um, you know, what are we doing with the benefits and the resources of these different carbon removal solutions or where are they going to be deployed or um, you know, how are we engaging communities that potentially would have to adopt these practices? Like, are they involved in the conversation in the process? Are they involved in the decision-making? And all, honestly, all of the answers right now are no, um, or very minimally. And um, one thing that we've been trying to do is extend having conversations with environmental justice organizations and leaders, um, having conversations with community-based organizations themselves um, and asking if they're familiar with carbon removal or what they would like to know about it or how can we do a better job with the research that we're putting forward? How can we co-create research that actually answers these questions like what are the, the land-based impacts or what are the pollution impacts? Um, and then also, I think this was in um, the chat, but uh, who is investing in these technologies and, and in doing so, who owns these technologies or these practices or the rights to them or the information, is it open source? Is this data gonna be available for everyone? Like what are the transparency and accountability questions? Um, so all that to say that carbon removal has done a pretty terrible job of being um, uh, transparent about equity and justice, but um, I'm hoping that by having these conversations and um, bringing other perspectives in that can critique these assumptions that have been leading the conversation up until now or find ways that we can actually deploy solutions in communities that want them um, and in ways that they want them in ways in which they actually benefits them and not just continues to harm um, these communities. So really long answer saying it hasn't really been done, but I'm really hoping that we're able to, to do better. No, thank you. I appreciate that. And Rosalie, you talked about in your presentation um, cumulative impacts and um, environmental justice impacts. So I'm just curious why for methane and the work that you're doing at EDF, is that part of the approach of looking at the, the policy um, potential in methane? Uh, thanks, Tina. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, a critical piece um, of, of our methane advocacy. You know, I think um, the practices um, and control technologies that reduce methane um, also reduce um, emissions of, of volatile organic compounds and hazardous air pollutants um, just by the fact of you know when natural gas is, is leaking out it's composed of all of those things um, it's predominantly methane but it's, it's also the seas and um, and air toxics uh, so when we're you know looking to control 
uh, methane were, were also um, driving down uh, those other emissions. Um, and so I think that, you know, that, that has been an important you know, piece of our, our advocacy so far. I think there is, you know, continued um, room for, uh, for growth there as well. Um, you know, as we're looking forward uh, into a Biden administration and, and we're looking to, um, you know, what do sort of ambitious new regulations look like, uh, regulations that, you know, drive far deeper methane reductions than, um, than anything that's been instituted so far. Um, how are we also ensuring uh, that um, that those regulations are also reducing uh, local air pollution um, and delivering benefits for you know the communities that live directly with oil and gas pollution? Um, you know, are as as we look to new technologies, you know, are those new technologies not just reducing methane but but also um, addressing uh, the, the local air pollution. And so I think that's um, something that has been, um, you know, been, been something that um, we at NDF and, and um, others in the, the sort of methane space um, have been thinking about, but I think it um, needs to um, continue to, to occupy a, a place of focus and um, is, is something that will be an important part of conversations um, to come in the new administration. Great, thanks. Um, does anyone else have questions that I've either missed or that you would like to ask of our panelists? Okay, hearing- I could, I could venture, a, can I venture a closing comment? Yeah, but I was gonna say, please, if there are any <laughs> comments by our panelists, I would like you to take the floor and offer them. Just a couple of thoughts spurred by, by some of the things, uh, issues people have raised uh, today. Um, uh, one, I would say one uh, potentially attractive thing about direct air capture and storage is that uh, it does not have to be anywhere near people. In theory, you could put it in the Sahara, you could put it in the Arctic, you could put it on a mountaintop. It just sucks air in, strips out the CO2, and then pipe it somewhere. Uh, ideally, go to a remote area stick it right on top of a good geologic formation, uh, suck in the, the CO2 and stick it in the ground. Obviously that's simplistic. You also need energy to run these, these facilities. So maybe you need to build a power line to run there. But one, I think that's one attractive feature is it doesn't need to be near people generally. Uh, second, I would also encourage everyone to uh, always kind of Look under the hood, dig into the details, and and not not paint with uh, with a broad brush in looking at uh, different carbon capture and storage options, different uh, carbon dioxide removal options. Just to and to give a, a a key example, there is one very promising carbon capture and storage technology applied to gas that's been demonstrated at a 50 megawatt level in Texas. It's called, uh, the, the company doing it is called Net Power. And instead of burning the gas and then ca capturing the CO2 afterwards and having some other NOx emissions and maybe a tiny bit of particles, particulates or something else coming from gas, they instead do something on the front end where they separate air into nitrogen and oxygen and then burn the gas in a pure stream of oxygen so it comes out with very low pollutants, no NOx because you're nitrogen oxides because you've taken the nitrogen out of the whole combustion process. So what comes out is a nice stream of pure CO2, ready to capture, ready to, ready to stick in the ground. You know, So building a net power plant near people would have a very low environmental uh, uh, footprint. So th that's the kind of thing that you know, look look deep and granularly at you know what is the uh, what is the kind of plant that someone is proposing in a certain area. Yeah, thanks, Ugbad and um, Rosalie. Parting words for us. 
potential um, investments <laughs> in companies. Um, no, I would just say uh, thank you so much for um, having me and really enjoyed the conversation today. Um, and yeah, I look forward to continuing it. Thank you. Aim, thank you so much for, for having this conversation. And um, I really hope that we're able to continue. I think it's just really helpful to hear other questions and, and perspectives um, on carbon removal and just in climate policy in general. So thank you, Tina, for inviting me. Yep, well, thank you each for participating. And um, again, thanks uh, to Corinne uh, from the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum um, out of WEACT for also co-hosting this. Uh, this was a really important discussion because it is policy um, issue areas that we should be looking at um, and the conversation will continue. Um, we will be doing another webinar on the 8th of December on nuclear energy within the same vein, learning more about the different policies that are, that are out. Um, there was a bill that was just um, put out, I think, yesterday um, that we'll be looking at. So these conversations will continue and hopefully we'll be able to advance the discussion as we learn more. Um, if there are any questions for the panelists, you are, I can shoot an email with a thank you to everyone and give you their email addresses. Um, and I think you all will send me your presentations and I can get that out to uh, the participants here on today's call. But thank you all so very much. It was a pleasure. I learned a lot. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Tina. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Thank yeah. you. Okay, bye. Bye.